So we're approaching the end of the lecture. And now we're looking at a very recent and very new coding scheme that is called a polar code or a class of codes that are called polar codes. Polar codes are pretty new. They are, yeah, they from first proposed, they were in 2007. And then it took a few years until they got noticed. And it really kick started in 2010 around. So it's 10, 12 years old right now. And they have already made their way into the 5G communication standard where they are being used for transmitting control data. We are going to look very briefly into polar codes in this lecture. And um, especially we're looking at three aspects. And uh, with this, you have at least the understanding of the basics of polar codes. So let's introduce polar code first. So polar codes are novel in the respect that they are quite different from the block codes that we're used to know. They work on a very different principle. And um, they essentially come from an information theory point of view as essentially a tool to show that there exist other coding schemes than just random codes that are capacity achieving. So actually we can prove that polar codes are capacity achieving and they are so over a broad range of input memoryless channels. So um, polar codes are essentially based on a recursive transform of size n that polarizes the channel into different subchannels. So what we have is we have a, a channel and uh, we take this channel and we generate new synthetic channels. And uh, we have a log of data. We transform this to n synthetic new subchannels. And out of these subchannels, we will show that k are actually perfectly reliable. They don't distort the signal at all. And the remaining n minus k, they are totally unreliable. So there is no way that we can transmit useful information over those channels. So we transmit the information over the useful channels and we transmit some known garbage data, which we call frozen data, over the remaining unreliable channels. At the receiver, we have a very simple decoder and um, that's essentially the main concept. The drawback is that polar codes in many scenarios are not yet uh, competitive with LPC codes. And uh, in particular, we need very long block lengths n to be really competitive or different decoders. So there has been a lot of work on finding different and new types of decoders. And with these decoders, we can actually get very good comparable performance than other codes, even for um, small lengths n. So let's take a look at the communication friendly channels. We have two channels over which it is very easy to communicate. The first channel is the noiseless channel. So a noiseless channel has a channel output Y being equal to the channel input X. The mutual information of this channel is equal to one bit. So coding is not necessary. We have a binary input. This is what we assume. So we have binary input. So we have mutual information of one. Coding is not necessary for this channel. So we can just transmit the data and we can receive the data without doing any errors. Then we have the maximally noisy channel. Maximally noisy channel, the mutual information is equal to zero. The channel output is statistically independent from the channel input. No information that is being conveyed from the channel input to the channel output. So all data transmission attempts are futile over this channel and can be, shall be avoided. So there's no way that we can communicate reliably over this channel. So the idea of polar codes is we transform the channel that we have into a sequence of communication friendly channel. So we have a channel and we transform it to some channels that are communication friendly, either noiseless or maximally noisy. So how do we do this? Um, so, yeah. 
we saw already communication is easy because we transmit data over the noiseless channels and we transmit fixed bit values over the useless channels. So there was a mishap here. So we transmit known data over the full channels. So um, how can we do this? Well, for this, we take a look at something that is called a basic transformation. And here is this basic transformation that we see. So this basic transformation is essentially a very simple device. So what we do is we take two input bits, we do input bit U1, we take a second input bit U2. And then we generate a bit X1, which is the sum of U1 plus U2. We take the modulo 2 sum, so sum over the field of binary integers, binary numbers, and we generate x1. x1 is u1 plus u2. And then we transmit x1 over the channel, e of y given x, giving us y1. That's fine. Then we take the second bit u2. The second bit is transmitted directly over the channel. Here's the channel, it's a probabilistic device, p of y given x, and we receive y2. Second bit is transmitted directly. So that's the basic transformation that we have. So that one is yeah, pretty easy. So let's take a look at what this basic transformation implies. And for this, we take a look at the information theory or the capacity of the channels. So the communication channel is um, this input symmetric, output symmetric, and it's characterized by its digital information, which at the same time, because of symmetricity, is uh, the capacity. So we have the mutual information, parentheses here, of the channel, and that's just the usual, um, usual equation of the mutual information. So don't go into the equation, because that's the equation that we know from chapter. And we say the mutual information is I gamma because gamma denotes the channel. I gamma. And we assume that the input bits of the channels are uniformly distributed, which is the case if both U1 and U2 are going to be uniformly distributed. So now we look at the two-dimensional channel. So we take the channel consisting of two input bits U1 and U2, transmit them and we receive two output bits, y1 and y2. So we have a channel, actually, that has two input bits, u1 and u2, and we have two output bits, y1 and y2. And in between, we have the channels, p of y given x, and we have the basic transformation. So that is in the equivalent Channel. So now we calculate the mutual information over this combined channel. So that's the mutual information of u1, u2, and between u1, u2, and y1, y2. So the basic transformation is invertible. So if we know u1, u2, x, or if we know x1 and x2, we can recover u1 and u2. Because we can just say x1 is u1 plus u2, and x2 is equal to u2, and then we can invert. So we know that u2 is equal to x2, then u1 is equal to x1 plus x2. So it is invertible, so it doesn't change the mutual information. So it's the same as the mutual information between x1 and x2, and y1 and y2. And because the channel is memoryless, this is two times the this is actually the mutual information between x1, y1, and x2, y2. This is two times the capacity of the channel. This means that when we apply this basic transformation, it does not degrade the channels, so it does not reduce the capacity. So that is already good, so we don't make anything worse by applying this basic transformation. So now we look at the channel again. So we look at the joint capacity. So we know that the 
mutual information between U1, uh, U2 and Y1 and Y2 is two times I gamma. And now we apply the chain rule of mutual information. So that's the mutual information between U1 and Y1, Y2 plus the mutual information between U2 and Y1, Y2 given U1. So we assume that U1 is given. So now we take this expression. So we look at the mutual information between U2, Y1, Y2, and U1. And we apply the chain rule of mutual information to that one again. And that is the mutual information between U2 and U1 plus the mutual information between U2 and Y1, Y2 given U1. And in this same expression as here. And U1 and U2 are assumed to be independent because we have an independent bit that we transmit. So this mutual information is equal to zero. This is equal to zero. So we can say, we can plug this guy and replace it with this expression. So what we get is two times mutual information of the channel capacity, the mutual information between U1 and Y1, Y2, plus the mutual information between U2 and Y1, Y2, U1. Okay, so we have decomposed our channel into two different uh, mutual information or two different channels that have the same capacity overall together. So we have two channels now. Look at this is channel one, channel one, and we call it channel gamma minus. And this is the mutual information of a channel that we call gamma plus. So let's take a look at these two channels. So we have two equivalent channels. We have a channel gamma minus, it has a binary input. See, the binary input is U1, and it has two outputs, Y1 and Y2. So it has a binary input, and it has two outputs from the set of allowed outputs, which is calligraphic Y squared. This is a channel, sorry, channel with input U1 and two outputs Y1 and Y2. So now we're looking at the next channel. The next channel, gamma plus, has a binary input U2 and it has three outputs. So it has output Y1, Y2, and it has an output U1. It's considered a channel output because it's on the right-hand side of the semicolon. Channel gamma plus has input it's binary and it has an output, it's three outputs, so it has two channel outputs belong to the set calligraphic Y and it has a binary output. Input U2 and three outputs Y1, Y2 and U1. It may sound a little bit strange to have U1 as a channel output, but pretty soon it will become clear what this means operationally. So operationally, the meaning of this is one of successive decoding. So we have a channel gamma minus. We have observations y1 and y2, and we decode u1. So this is the channel gamma minus. So the capacity of this channel is this one. So it's the mutual information between u1 and y1, y2. This is I of gamma minus. And now we have decoded U1. So U1 is available. And we can use U1 as an additional observation because it has been decoded. So we use U1 as additional observation together with Y1 and Y2, decode U2. And this channel has a capacity of I of gamma plus which is the mutual information between U2, Y1, Y2, and U1. Okay. So, now we can say that we have 
two channels, the sum of the mutual information is equal to two times the mutual information of the individual channels. We haven't changed anything. We just interpret things a little bit differently. So what we also can say when we take a look at the mutual information of the channel gamma plus, we can again apply the chain rule of mutual information. Then we get this is the mutual information of u2 uh, and between u2 and y2 plus the mutual information between u2, y1, u1 given y2. This is a very the guy that doesn't really say anything, so we can just say mutual information is always non-negative, so this is larger or equal than zero. We can say that i of gamma plus is larger or equal than i of u2 and x2, equal to the mutual information between x2 and y2, and this is equal to i of gamma. So we can say that the mutual information of this channel i of gamma plus is larger or equal than the channel i of gamma, the original channel. So we have created a new channel i of gamma of gamma plus that has a higher mutual information than the previous channel. And because we have two times i of um, gamma, the sum of i of gamma plus plus i of gamma minus, this must mean that i of gamma minus is smaller equal than i of gamma. So the mutual information of this channel gamma minus is smaller or equal than the mutual information of the original channel. So to summarize, we have generated two artificial channels, gamma plus and gamma minus. Gamma plus has a higher capacity than the original channel, and gamma minus has a lower capacity. When we sum up the two capacities, we get twice the original channel's capacity. So we didn't lose anything in the process. This is important. We have generated one channel that has higher mutual information and one channel has a lower mutual information. All right, so this is what we have, what is called channel polarization. So we polarize the channel, we start with two channels that are equal, and one gets better, the other gets worse. So this is how we can essentially work. This is an illustration of this successive decoding. So we have, um, so what we need to do is we want to transmit over this channel gamma minus and we want to recover the data. So we need a channel code that is designed for this channel gamma minus and we transmit a message m minus over this channel code. Then we get some data u1. Uh, we have a channel code that is designed for the channel gamma plus. Then we get our sequence u2 by encoding m plus, apply the basic transformation, transmit the sequence x1, x2, y1, y2 over the channel, and then we have our decoder for gamma minus. So our gamma minus has access to the um, has access to y1 and y2, and it generates an output sequence um, after decoding it gets an output sequence m minus hat, which is the same as uh, we can then use to recover u1 hat. We get m minus hat. By re-encoding, we get u1 hat. It's just a code word. And then we feed u1 hat into the decoder for gamma plus. And together with y1 and y2, we can recover the message m plus. We have encoding and successive decoding of the equivalent channels. We channel gamma minus needs an encoder of rate r minus, which encodes the message m minus, and it needs an encoder of rate r plus, which encodes the message m plus. And then first we decode the message m minus hat, which gives us u1 hat. And this one we feed to the decoder for gamma plus and we reconstruct m plus hat, hence also u2 hat. So here we have the, the two channels 
are represented as a diagram. So the, the channel gamma minus has u1 as input and it generates from the basic transformation it generates x1 and x2 and there is some u2. We don't know u2. So u2 essentially acts as noise. So we have some u2 that acts as noise inside the channel, but we observe a noisy version of this noise. So we have some noise inside this channel, and we have extra noise here as well, but this u2 acts as an additional noise, which we don't know, but we get a noisy observation of this noise. This is the idea of having um, the channel put Y2. It's a noise observation of this U2 noise. For the channel gamma plus, the situation is different because here we exactly know the noise because we have access to U1. So U1 is available. And then we have X1, X2 that are being distorted by the original channel. And U2 is the input. So U2 is the input. We get U1, Y1, and Y2 as an output of this channel, gamma plus. So with this, we can uh, calculate the transition probabilities. So we can calculate the probabilities um, of the channel gamma minus of observing Y1, Y2, given that U1 has been at the input. So there's a probability of Y1, Y2 given U1. We can obtain this by first marginalizing over u2 so we marginalize over u2 then we apply base theorem so this gives you p of y1 y2 given u1 u2 p of u1 uh, u2 given u1 this is just p of u2 because u2 is independent of u1 and because we have memorylessness we can decompose this uh, probability as the product of the two probabilities, individual probabilities for the two channel outputs is because of memorylessness. And this is because of independence. And P of U2 is equal to one half. And then we have the remaining messages and then we just plug in the numbers. So we just plug in the values of U2 then we get this expression down here. We can do the same for gamma plus. Um, or we can give us a more compact notation for gamma minus. So it's one half times P of Y1 given U1 times P of Y2 given zero plus one half times P of Y1 given U1 complementary times p of y2 given 1. So again, we can do the same for gamma plus and we get the, I won't go to the details of the equation, we get gamma plus is 1 half times p of y given u1 plus u2. Remember, u1 is given, so we know u1, times p of y2. So let's take a look at an example. And we're looking at our old friend, the binary erasure channel, because in the binary erasure channel, things tend to become a little bit easier. So we first start by looking at the channel gamma minus. So we have been looking at the channel inputs, we have channel input, and the channel input is u1. Then we have a channel output. Channel output is y1, y2. And we have the transition probability. Which is gamma minus y1, y2 given u1. We have a question. Can we recover U1. 
So we assume u1 is given. We have u1, 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 u1. Now we have four possibilities for the channel output. So the first possibility is we receive u1 plus u2 and u2. So nothing is erased. This happens with probability 1 minus epsilon squared. Can we recover u1? Yes, we can recover u1 because we can, yes, because u1 is equal to u1 plus u2 plus u2. We have axes at the sum, we have axes as u2, so we just sum them up, then we get u1. So then we have the possibility that we receive u1 plus u2, and the second channel output is erased. So we have an erasure at the second channel output. This happens with probability epsilon times 1 minus epsilon. And now we cannot recover because we cannot recover u1. We just have u1 plus u2. We don't have, we have no idea what u2 is. So there is nothing we can do here. Essentially, the channel will output an erasure. We cannot recover u1, but the channel will output an erasure. So then we have the possibility that we receive a question mark on erasure and u2. It happens also with probability epsilon times 1 minus epsilon. And again, there is nothing we can do here. And um, essentially, we cannot recover u1. There is no way that we can get u1 from this channel. So we have an erasure as well. Then the final case is we have two erasures. And this happens with probability epsilon squared. Again, there is nothing we can do here because we have access to um, nothing, essentially. And we get an erasure. So it means u1 can only be recovered if we have both u1 plus u2 and u2. And that means that we know that u1 plus u2 plus u2 is equal to u1. So the channel gamma minus essentially is a channel that outputs as an input u1 and it has as an output, we can say as output u1 with probability 1 minus epsilon squared. And it has an erasure with probability epsilon squared plus 2 epsilon times 1 minus epsilon, which is equal to epsilon squared plus 2 epsilon minus 2 epsilon squared, which is equal to 2 epsilon minus epsilon squared. So to summarize, we can say that gamma minus nothing else as a binary erasure channel with error probability 2 epsilon minus epsilon squared. So we have generated a new binary erasure channel, essentially. OK. So we have new binary erasure channel. So now let's take a look at the channel um, gamma plus. We're looking at the channel gamma plus. So again, we have a channel input, which is u2. We have a channel output. Channel output is y1, y2, and u1. Then we have the transition probability.
which is gamma plus of y1, y2, u1 given u2. Then we ask ourselves the question, can we recover u2? Okay, so let's take a look again at the four cases. So we input u2 always. We have the possibility that we have the output y1. So both are not erased, so we get u1 plus u2. We get u2 and we have u1 at our disposal. So both channel outputs are not erased. This happens with probability 1 minus epsilon squared. Can we recover? U or U2, of course, because we have directly access to U2, we can recover. Okay, first case done. So now assume that U2 is erased. We have U1, U2, we have an erasure, but we have U1. This happens with probability epsilon times one minus epsilon. Can we recover U2? Yes, of course, we can recover because we can calculate u1 plus u2 plus u1. So, because we have u1 at our disposal, we just add it to the sum and we get u2. So then let's look at the third case. So we have the first channel output is erased. Then we get u2 and we get u1. That happens with probability epsilon times one minus epsilon. Can we get u2? Of course, because we immediately have it. So then the final case, both channel outputs are erased and we have u1, but u1 doesn't help us. So even this helps focus with probability epsilon squared, but now we cannot recover u2 because we have no meaningful information for u2 and we have question marks away. There's nothing we can do. There is an erasure. So U1. Uh, U1 is readily available at the channel output. So we and always recover U2 unless both U1 plus U2 um, unless both Y1 and Y2 are erased. And this happens with probability epsilon squared. So we have a channel gamma plus. The channel has an input u2. Essentially, it has an output that is u2 with probability 1 minus epsilon squared. And it is an erasure with probability epsilon squared. So we have a channel gamma plus that is a binary erasure channel of erasure probability epsilon squared. Yeah. So we have generated now two new equivalent channels, one with erasure probability epsilon and one with erasure probability epsilon squared. I'm sorry, one gamma minus has an erasure probability two epsilon minus epsilon squared, and the other one has erasure probability epsilon squared. Sum up, take the sum up to both, get an erasure probability epsilon, which is our original channel. So to summarize, we generate new two new binary erasure channels, gamma minus, binary erasure channel with erasure probability epsilon minus epsilon squared, 
and the channel gamma plus, which is a binary ratio channel, with the ratio probability epsilon squared. Epsilon squared is always smaller or equal than epsilon, so it has a lower erasure probability, and 2 epsilon minus epsilon squared is larger than epsilon, higher erasure probability. Again, you see this polarizing effect. Okay, so now we have shown that the basic transformation essentially um, generates two new artificial channels that when we apply this basic transformation and uh, we have a successive decoding polarizes. One has a slightly higher capacity, one a slightly lower capacity. Then we saw we can use this by using coding on the outside what we do next is we apply this polarizing transform and we construct new channels that allow us, give us an easier communication. So what we do is we take this, um, take this um, channel, basic transformation, applied two times. So here we have the basic transformation apply two times. So we generate two channels, which have an input V1 that sees the channel gamma minus, and here we have an input V2 that sees the channel gamma plus. And then we take another basic transformation. We have an input V3 that sees the channel gamma minus. We have an input V4 that sees the channel gamma plus. So now we have two channels gamma minus what we can do is we can combine them again using a basic transformation. So we apply a basic transformation on this channel gamma minus. And then we get a channel gamma minus minus. So U1 sees a channel gamma minus minus and U2 sees a channel gamma minus plus. We can do the same for gamma plus. We have two channels gamma plus. We have a channel here that's gamma plus. We have a channel here that's gamma plus. And now we can combine the two channels gamma plus with the basic transformation. I'm just going to wait until my annotation disappears. It will slowly disappear. It's running. Here we go. So, getting there, okay, so now we take the channels gamma plus and we apply a basic transformation to the channels gamma plus. And now we get channels gamma plus minus and gamma plus plus. And we can calculate the effective um, erasure probabilities for those channels by just Knowing that both if we have a binary ratio channel by just knowing these are um, ETs with um, epsilon minus, epsilon plus, and then we can calculate the equivalent erasure probabilities of the channels. So we can continue this and we can recursively apply the basic transformation once more. So what we can do is we can take this. Um, basic transformation and we can just uh, repeat it essentially. We can take this basic transformation and then we will just repeat it. So we're just going to paste it two times here. This is uh, not yet sufficient. This should be sufficient. Okay, so then let's paste it again. Okay, so. Okay, so we have two times this um, basic transformation. Now we have two channels gamma minus minus. We have a channel gamma minus minus here. We have a channel gamma minus minus here. So we apply a basic transformation. Let me just use enough space here. 
We take this guy, this guy, and this one. Up here. So here we have a channel gamma minus minus minus. And here we have a channel gamma minus minus plus. Okay, now we have two channels gamma plus minus. So we're going to combine them. Combine them. And here we have a channel gamma plus minus minus. We have a channel gamma plus minus plus. And we continue like this. So we take the channels gamma minus plus. Things like here. And we generate channels gamma minus plus minus and gamma minus plus plus. And finally, we have this last channel. So we have channels gamma plus plus minus and we get a channel gamma plus plus plus. So that's how we can combine the channels um, three times. So now we have uh, the threefold application of these channels. So we have generated a couple of eight new channels, gamma minus minus, gamma plus plus plus. So we see here we have all the possible combinations of arranging plus and minuses. So this is uh, shown here and we can repeat this. We repeat this over and over again. We could take these, then uh, generate it two times, then getting the channels gamma minus minus minus, then getting the channels gamma plus plus plus, uh, and so on. So let's do it once more. So we take the channels over here, and we paste them. So we need to do it once more. And work as expected. So we paste those. Now we need to reduce the size again a little bit. Go and do it once more. Okay. So now what we're going to do is here we have the channel gamma minus minus minus. Here we have the channel gamma minus minus minus. So what we're going to do is we're just going to combine them again. With a basic transformation. Then we're getting a channel gamma minus 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 and gamma minus 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 plus. And we can continue like this. So we can take those channels, combine them using a basic transformation. Those channels, combine them with a basic transformation. And essentially we can continue like this. I don't want to draw all of them, but it starts to get a little bit complicated, but this is essentially what we're going to do. And we can repeat this over and over again as often as we like. And we see that the, the complexity of this is n log n. And n is the number of, of uh, channel users with the number of um, essentially channels you have. So here we have eight channels. So we have n operations that we do times log n because we need a log n stages. So here we have log two of eight three stages, and in each stage we need to them in the order of n operations. So the complexity of this is relatively low, and log n is a okay complexity, and uh, this is, um, there are also fast algorithms for implementing this. Okay, so if we do this, and we can calculate the equivalent channel erasure probabilities, then we get um, these numbers, 
So here we get um, equivalent binary erasure channel probabilities and um, for both the um, good channels and the, the, the bad channels. So we can um, essentially calculate this extremely easily. So we can uh, just go to a Unix window. We can just go to our, um, our window and then we can just calculate. So let's make a direct with polar codes. And then we generate a script called polarize. And we use AWK. And we assume that the erasure probability E is the first comment line argument. And then we just print the good channel and the bad channel. So the good channel has erasure probability E squared. So it's E times E. And the bad channel has erasure probability 2E minus E squared, which is E times 2 minus E. Okay, so we have this. So now we can um, take, for instance, erasure probability of 0 0.5, and we give it to this. So we need to make this script executable. So then we just um, run this. Um, yes. So we get two erasure probabilities, 0 0.25 and 0 0.75. So this is what we have here. We have 0 0.75 and 0 0.25. So now we can apply this polarization again to these two channels. So what we get is then we apply the erasure probability again to this one. So we polarize again. And now we get um, four channels, 0 0.0625, 0 0.435, 0 0.5. 625, 0 0.9375. So this is um, then what we can plot as well. So let's do this. We can plot this. And these are the performances of the channels we get. So if you want to plot this um, using your um, using your in your console. So for instance, you can save this in a file. So it's P, P2, for instance, because we apply the polarization two times. Then we just call the GNU plot and we plot P2. And then we see the different, um, the different points here in P2. So we can apply this once more. So let's the polarization step once more. Then we get eight numbers. We see already the first number is already getting very, very small. So 0 0.003. And one channel, this is the gamma minus, 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 has a very high erasure probability of 0 0.99. Again, plotting this, so we can put this into P3 and call the new plot and we plot P3, and we see that now um, there are some channels that have a high erasure probability and some that are low, so one that has a very low erasure probability and some that are in between. Okay, we have this, we can do this in a more beautiful way. So let's take a look at our slides by it plot this in a more beautiful way. So I also, sorted slightly differently. So this is the channel gamma minus minus, and then we are getting to the good channels. So essentially, if I'm plotting first gamma minus minus, then plotting first gamma plus plus, this would be the same. So we can change this. Um, so we change this and 
we plot first e times 2 minus e. Um, and then we print e times e. And we don't need this one. Plotting this will now look exactly like the graph we had before. So this is how we can easily do this, even without having MATLAB, just with state-of-the-art operating system tools that you have at your disposal. So this is something very, very easy. So now let's um, take a look further, what happens further. What we see already, the, there is no sorting of the channels. So, so there is here a jump. So this channel seems to be very good. This one seems to be very bad again. These channels seem to get better. So let's continue. Four stages, looks like this. 15 stages, or five stages, looks like this. Um, six stages, it's like this. Seven stages, eight stages, nine stages. 10 stages, 11 stages, and we see that some channels are very good, some are very bad, and some are in between. So we go to 12 stages. So we can plot this also in our system. So in order to do plot 12 stages, what we do is we insert or we um, make a new script called polarize four. So I just call this polarize comment four times after each other. So and then when I do this, so for instance I have dash 0 0.5 erasure probability of polarize four. Now I have four stages suitable so I have four stages meaning 16 numbers then one more polarized four will give me 256 and here you can see already some very very small very small erasure probabilities and once more that I get to 12 stages to power four times three is 12 stages so I should get 4096 different erasure probabilities and count the lines, this is 4096, perfect. And we see some are very, very small, some are very large. We can plot, we can put those into P12, then plot. And here we see so some, and this is probably even a little bit easier to see here. So we have some that are zero, very close to zero, some that are close to one, and then we have some points in between, some intermediate points in between. So what we do now is we just sort them. So let's um, let's sort this. So before opening the file, we sort the numbers. So we sort numerically and then we input into P12S. Oh. Oops, I didn't make it. So this was a mistake from my side to change the background. Okay. So let's, uh, let's plot the sorted one. So we plot the sorted ones. And here we see that there is a very, very nice curve now. So we see that some channels are very low. And then we have very sharp transitional behavior. So some get very large um, error ratio probability. And then some belong to the um, ratio probability that is close to one. So they are completely erased. So um, yeah, let's take a look at um, the sorted outputs of what happens. We look at the sorted outputs. So here we show the same graphs after sorting. 
So we start with after four stages, we see that this transitional behavior is also seen when we sort this equivalent channel indices from smallest to largest. And then it continues like this with five stages, six stages, seven stages, eight stages, nine stages, 10 stages, 11, 12. So what we see is also that the fraction of channels that are less than 0 0.5 seems to be exactly half. So half of the channel seem to be below erasure probability 0 0.5 with many of them being close to zero, and half of the channels seem to be above erasure probability 0 0.5, with many being close to one. And we could repeat this. Um, here it's with 16 stages. It's even, it's even sharper, the threshold. It's almost like a step function. And with 20 stages, we see this very, very, very clear step. There are almost no channels that are intermediate, almost all the channels have erasure probability zero, and almost all the channels have erasure probability one. So this is um, very interesting behavior. And this is a behavior that we're going to investigate in detail in the next video. So here it's another example. So we can insert also a different erasure probability. That is, of course, pretty easy. That's something that we easily do. So um, for instance, in our comment line, we will just input different erasure probability, and then we get the, the different number. And then we can just plot the plot, do the plotting, and I show you the results here on the slides. So this is the um, equivalent binary erasure channel probability. Um, or epsilon equals 0 0.2. And again, can increase the number of stages. And we see that um, 16 stages also approaches a step-like function. And now it seems that 0 point, fraction of 0 0.2 of the channels are actually bad channels. Fraction of channels that are actually converging to one or polarizing to one is equal to epsilon. The fraction of channels that approaches zero is equal to one minus epsilon. Look at the, the numbers here. And again, for 20 stages, it's even more dramatic. This is exactly a fraction of 0 0.2 of this area. So this is rather astonishing. And in the, as I said in the next video, we're going to look at this polarization effect further. And then we're going to see how this polarization effect um, happens in practice or what does it what it does mean for the practical setting.